My name is Adam Schultz. I'm a writer and an explorer. And my dream is to try to cross nearly 4,000 kilometers of Canada's Arctic wilderness alone. As far as anyone knows, this has never been attempted before. Probably because no one was stupid enough to try it. It's a very Canadian approach I have. You know, just coming out here, skating around by myself as a way to train. My first playground was the forest that surrounded my family home. I mean, that's where I grew up. I grew up in the woods. Uh, all around us where we lived, we were in a really small town, was forest. Um, so with my dog and my brother, we would always be out in those woods, uh, building shelters and making fire without matches and catching frogs. And my father, he would encourage us and he taught us all the different trees and how to build birch bark canoes and cedar strip canoes. and. Um, that's where I really fell in love with the natural world and just came to a really appreciate it. I mean, I think it's so important that we uh, preserve it and that's always been a, a big part of who I am and, and why I do these expeditions and these journeys because I feel like that's the most important thing there is, this natural world, and we try to preserve it. When I zoom in on the satellite imagery, I, me I measure all the, the exact distances so I'll know exactly, like, well, okay, I've got, you know, 27 kilometers to go this day to the, where I want to get to, or, you know, 13 kilometer portage here. But um, to get an actual topographic map, I'm using uh, Garmin Basecamp over here on this laptop, and I'm copying my route uh, manually from the satellite imagery onto the topographic maps here, and then I can download, download the topographic maps onto this little device here, the GPS, and carry with this with me in the field. The winner is Adam something super tough, durable, that can withstand all the punishment that the Arctic can dish out to it, so. Polar bears mostly stay on the sea coast, and they only come inland um, a little bit. So what about a grizzly bear? There's lots of grizzlies, but I figure I can take a grizzly. <laughs> you can take one. <laughs> With yeah. what? My bayonet. You think I should take a gun? Something more than a bayonet. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bear spray. Or, or yeah, bear spray. Yeah, you're gonna make it your, yourself yeah. flavorful while he comes at you. It's just that I have to travel as light as possible, and the gun is cumbersome, and it has to be kept protected. It has to be inside a waterproof case. I showed you a small gun. I, I, I'd be bringing a gun with me personally. I know it's a lot of work and everything, but I don't know. He's uh, he's crazy not to. I mean, like polar bears, everything. Like it, it can happen, especially if they're hungry this time of year. So he's definitely got like a lot to undertake. I have full confidence in, in his ability to, to be able to 
carry this out. Um, but there are things out there that see humans as a meal, especially in the part of Canada that he's going. There's things that could stalk him for, for multiple days and him not even know it. The expedition that he's going to do now is going to be very tough. There's a lot of unknowns and it's a long distance and he has a lot of gear to carry. It's very tough. I would say there's only a small percentage of people that probably could do it, especially doing it alone. That makes it even harder. When you talk about an expedition that's going to span several months, uh, several thousand kilometers, how could you not look at it by asking the question, is it possible? Will he be able to do it? So I know he has his determination working for him. I think he has that advantage over top of anyone else. I'm nowhere near as nervous as my mom, I can tell you that. I'll sleep fine at night. I have quiet confidence about it. Um, I won't be as near nervous as my dad, who will be slightly less nervous than my mom, but I'll be nervous thinking about it and hope for the best because realistically, it's like tackling the near impossible. But yeah, like his dream is my mom's worst nightmare. Super lightweight, but I'm getting a fat shaft, 12 degree one. So it's a little more efficient for flat water and this will be for whitewater rapids. I don't know if this is gonna be enough gorilla tape. And I'm gonna go to buy a second. What size canoe are you taking? 15 foot, solo, built for me by Novacraft, weighs 53 pounds. Made really? out of this uh, tough stuff, super hard. Uh, you can hit it with a sledgehammer and won't break it. If you don't make it back, can I have it? Yep. I don't think he's gonna have the anxiety that uh, most people would probably have out there. I think he's done enough of these and he's gotten out of his comfort zone. Uh, this is gonna be a very long trip, so that'll be new for him. Um, but I think he's going to be able to break it up into mentally shorter trips. You got you know, a month here, a month there. So I don't think he's looking at it as one big long trip. I think he's breaking it down into his mind as a series of smaller trips and smaller accomplishments. And I, th I think that's how you get past the, uh, the five-month issue, being out there by yourself. When you see the design, you know what I'm talking about. The, uh, it's like kind of more on the back of the head and more on the sides. So I like them better than last year. It's just all sand. It's, it's like unbelievable. You could have a, a beach picnic there, right? It's a big sim. They called it Sandy Creek for obvious reasons. But it turns out that that's not why they called it Sandy Creek. I was, uh, my, my eye was burning, so I just, the only water. Here's Dawson City. So we're coming down uh, the Klondike Highway. And then, so we're going east on the Klondike, and we're going up the Dempster through Tombstone Territorial Park, through here. What I've kind of done is I've taken all these 
historical accounts and stitched them together into one big epic journey. And no one knows if it's really possible to do it all in a single season. <laughs> you could do it maybe if you spread it out over several years, but it's gonna be a race against time to see if I can squeeze it all into one year. I mean, my first wilderness trip by myself, I was only 13 years old and I was terrified all night long, but you know, uh, 18 years later of, of wilderness adventure, it, you, you get into the rhythm of things and you start to feel much more comfortable. So now when I look out on that wilderness, I don't see an alien foreign environment. I see something that looks like home. So, you know, I'm in my element. There's nowhere I'd rather be in the world than right here. SOS. Thank you. This is the uh, send off, I suppose. Long time coming. Yeah, it's uh, this expedition has been three years in the making, at least three years. So it's been a long time coming to get up to the Arctic Circle. And now I'm finally here and all these years of planning and preparing and dreaming and visualizing has culminated in this moment. So we'll see how it goes from here. Godspeed. Thank you for all your support, Chuck. Yeah, uh, it's been a blast having you here as part of the expedition support. So that was awesome. It's an honor to help. Oh, well, I'm honored to have you and everyone else here. So very good. What a contrast from the days when it was just me. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm going to get to that pretty soon. OK. Look at the size of that. I mean, it's massive going off in that direction. So bear crap and bears all over the road here. And the road can give you a false sense of security. I mean, you think it's a little outpost of civilization, but it's not really. I mean, the, the grizzlies, they just walk right on the road. They do their business on the road. And probably coming down from those mountains there, And it kind of makes me want to keep, you know, one eye over my shoulder as I do this hike. I feel like I could almost be in one of those post-apocalyptic movies and uh, everything is just desolate and barren and I'm like one of the last people left alive on Earth looking out on this landscape. Here is my canoe fully loaded and ready to set off on my journey across the Arctic. And this canoe and I are about to become very good friends and very close companions. If I'm to cross the Arctic, I have no choice but to travel up river on many of these waterways because they're flowing north out to the Arctic Ocean and I have to go east if I'm to cross the Arctic. It's a matter of necessity.
the vast Mackenzie River. Over two kilometers wide, sometimes three kilometers wide. Way down there is my canoe. Who wants to be my pole? My main strategy for getting up river was kind of pulling along the bottom, a bit like uh, they do on those boats in Venice, a gondola, I think they're called them. So that's my that's my style. It's very romantic. I like to think as I pull my way up the Mackenzie River. I may be doing this journey alone, but in reality, I could never do it without the support of people like Chuck, Mark, my family, the crew. I mean, they've all been terrific, and it's just. I mean, it's, it's really an overwhelming feeling having done expeditions for years on a shoestring budget all by myself, not having anyone to support me. I mean, saying thanks doesn't seem adequate, but it's just really a really nice feeling knowing that there are people who out there who are rooting for me, who are cheering for me, supporting me, and uh, without, the, without their support, I really couldn't do it. That's the truth. Yeah, I got my stuff up here, satellite phone, first aid kit, bear spray, air horn. This is my little accoutrements of weapons, air bangers over there. My pillow, I just take my clothes and I, you know, socks, dirty socks and things, and I stick them inside my sleeping bag case, and that's my pillow, and I, you know, I love that pillow. It's so friggin' comfy. Look at the remains of that massive blister down there from hiking along the Dempster Highway. I think my dreams of becoming a foot model have pretty much been decisively ended now. It's pretty cold, but there's uh, there's no really no other option right now. I've got to wade across this mud flat, so I just took my boots and my socks off, uh, rolled up my pants. It's kind of like quicksand. Uh, it's pretty cold, but there didn't seem to be any other option. So here we go. There's the grizzly track. There's another one up here. Imagine if I'm just pulling along and the bank gives way and, and just smacks into my canoe and sends me into the river. Probably from the melting of the uh, permafrost and the ice breakup. It's uh, really quite strange though, coming along this section, I got a bit of a chill like you get in the grocery store when you go in the frozen food aisle. Um, that's kind of what it feels like with all these mounds of ice here. I can feel a bit of a chill coming off it as I go along. All this dirty ice that's melting. There's nothing quite like the smell of wet socks drying in your tent. It's 2.30 uh, a.m. and I was asleep and something woke me up outside the tent. There was a noise and it sounded like a big animal crashing through the woods, so I started yelling. That's what you normally do if there's a bear outside the tent, like, hey, 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 try to scare it off. And I could hear something crashing, so I unzipped the tent and looked out, grabbed my little air horn, and I went to squeeze it. It just made the hissing noise so the thing doesn't work. Um, so I thought it was a bear, but then I looked again and it wasn't a bear, it was a giant male moxoxen. A moxoxen. Just outside my tent in the bushes over there. This is my uh, 80s rock star hair look um, right now. My toe looks kind of messed up and it bled a little today. And I'm about to leave behind the familiar. That is the Mackenzie River over there. And head into the unknown. 
this new waterway that leads east into the forest. One thing I don't pack on expeditions are towels. So I'm just gonna have to air dry and shake like a dog. It's moving a little bit. Have to go check out what it is. I have to head that way anyways, but I'm gonna stay to the far bank for safety. It's best not to disturb us. I'd only been asleep for about an hour and 20 minutes and I heard a noise outside. I woke up and thankfully I'm a light sleeper because I heard something in the bushes and I heard the noise and instinctively when I hear a noise outside my tent, I start yelling. So if it is a bear, hopefully I scare it away. And I quickly unzipped the screen door, poked my head out and I saw something move in the bushes and sure enough, it was a black bear. I don't know if you can see it there. I propped my canoe up alongside of the tent to create like one side of a barrier. And thankfully I did, because the black bear was just on the other side in the bushes there. I started yelling at it in my most menacing and intimidating manner and smacking the paddle on the canoe, making as much noise as possible. And uh, eventually he walked off, he didn't run. He walked along the edge of the bushes there, down the shoreline. And I've continued to make noise, um, but I don't know how far he went. The more I've gone up this river and the more I've explored it, the more I've really uh, started to wonder about that old 1972 government report on the river. Uh, it described the landscape that the river flows through as, quote, subdued and gently rolling. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't describe that as subdued or gently rolling hills. I mean, that's a pretty spectacular peak right there. This is vertical cliff that rises uh, beside the river. That's pretty awesome. Mosquitoes are getting bad. It's never a nice feeling when you wake up and you, you see just, you know, hundreds of mosquitoes just waiting for you the second you unzip the screen door to come attack you. Looking pretty nasty. The nail's gonna fall off. But that's okay. And my, uh, my fingers have become incredibly sore, I think from gripping the, the pole so hard. It really, uh, it's really sore when I Go like this with them. Yeah, so my toenail has fallen off and uh, use an alcohol wipe on that and clean it up a bit. Uh, this morning is officially the first day of summer, but it's actually feels colder today than it's been the last several weeks. And I had a pretty good night sleep on this beach here, uh, except, you know, you never really sleep that soundly because there's always noises in the wilderness. Like right now, off to my left somewhere, I can hear a baby beaver crying and uh, there's geese that honk and birds that chirp. Um, throughout the night and sometimes like a few nights ago there's a bear that will wake you up or a bear woke me up at least um, when it's walking through the brush or you know you hear a mox ox and trumble or all kinds of things like that will wake you up but um, I guess eventually you just kind of get used to it that wolf yesterday that white one on the bank um, Actually, that was the most curious wolf I've ever seen. He actually looked at me for quite a long time. And, you know, he walked along the bank. It was almost like seeing a domesticated dog. The, the look in his eyes, the way that he stared at me. And uh, our eyes met and we looked at each other. And I filmed him. And uh, it was just, it was almost like having a friend in the wilderness seeing that wolf. It was just such a nice moment. This area has been burnt out before from a forest fire. But there's really high cliffs over there. And uh, the river, the Hare Indian River here is getting quite small and hemmed in by 
willow bushes on either side as I near the headwaters. There's just not a lot of vitamin C in granola bars and uh, dehydrated foods, but there's something I can do pretty easily uh, to remedy that uh, to make sure I don't get scurvy from lack of vitamin C, uh, which is to take, let me show you here, take some of the spruce, uh, take some of the spruce needles, which is loaded with vitamin C, and throw that in my pot, boil some water, and make spruce tea. Uh, they say that, you know, spruce tea has more vitamin C in it than orange juice. So that's pretty good, and then I don't have to worry about getting scurvy. disheartening sight behind me here. The river that I'm following pretty much just disappears into that morass. And uh, there's no question, I'm not gonna be able to drag the canoe through there. I'm gonna have to portage everything, which is not gonna be easy considering it's just like a foul morass of swamp and muskeg. But I think I'm almost at the next lake, so I just gotta tell myself that and try to find the mental stamina to push on. Well, I followed the river for as long as I possibly could, the Hare Indian River. My gear is behind me here, but there's uh, pretty much nothing left of it. Just this ditch. The current is clearly flowing that way. And that puts a smile on my face for a very important reason, uh, because that means, you know, all the water I've encountered so far has been flowing uh, the other direction. It's been flowing west, but this is flowing east. And because it's flowing east, that means I've crossed the divide between the Mackenzie River watershed and Great Bear Lake over here. I'm the only person on the whole lake, all to my lonesome. There's some caves way up there on the mountain slopes. And uh, when I say cave on a mountain, I, imagination always goes to strange places and I imagine what manner of creature might live up there. It is uh, 4.24 p.m. on June 25th, and I have just reached Great Bear Lake. Uh, this is a big achievement for me. Um, it's a new chapter in the expedition. It's like I've reached a new level, a new phase of the journey.
I've got the accumulating scrapes and bruises. Nice bruise. My uh, lovely fiance has made these super helpful labels for me because believe it or not, despite the fact that I'm filming this entire documentary, um, I'm not very good with technology. So she labeled everything like um, unplug as soon as charging is done. Plug this end into the solar panel, charge battery pack. It's very helpful. She labeled everything. I just came around the corner here and uh, this is what made my heart sink. There's just nothing but ice as far as the eye can see. And uh, it's a lot of ice. And it's gonna slow my progress right down to a crawl. There's just so much ice out there. Melting ice flows out there that's blocked up my passage along the coast of Great Bear Lake. So there's nothing I can do about it. I started at 3.30 a.m. and I'm operating on only three hours of sleep. I paddled 41 kilometers today on three hours of sleep. So I've made my camp on this beach, try to get as comfortable as I can. I'm gonna have a fire in a second and uh, just hope that when I wake up, this ice will be out of here and I can continue. 3.12 a.m. and I'm about to uh, set off through the ice here on Great Bear Lake. entirely possible I'm the only person on this entire vast body of water paddling right now, especially since it's still icy out there. I can't make it any further along Great Bear Lake. It's just my route is blocked by um, ice. All right, team, listen up. Mr. Canoe, Mr. Blue Barrel, paddles, everyone, I need your attention. Backpack, uh, we are going to be patient and we are gonna wait until the ice melts out there and then we can continue so today is a lesson in patience i know like me you're eager and you want to push on but it's just too much of a risk if we get stranded in that ice again uh and then the wind picks up it could take us way out into the heart of the lake and that would be extremely bad so team i'm proud of the work we've done together but right now we've got to try to be patient and just wait for that ice to melt it uh, seems like I'm not the first person to become stranded on this island here in the uh, center of the island. It looks like a long time ago, someone once had a campfire here because these four rocks look like they've been placed here. And in the center of the rocks, there's some very old bones, some animal bones where somebody cooked something. So somebody else maybe was stranded on this island too. Who knows, if I follow it, maybe I'll find a pot of gold. Actually, I would be more happy than just to find open water and no ice. I'll take that over the pot of gold. The longer I sit waiting for ice to melt, the less likely it becomes that I'll get all the way across the Arctic and then I have to, you know, reevaluate my goals, what I'm gonna do on this journey.
some pretty big ice flows out here, but most of the ice is melted. Iceberg dead ahead. Hard to starboard. Now I'm just trapped on a fog bound coast here. And this one looks less inviting than the other one. I can see some swampy alder bushes back in there. There's uh, somewhere out here in the woods, I know that there's ruins of uh, Fort Confidence. Fort Confidence was built almost 200 years ago um, as a fur trade fort on Great Bear Lake. And there's not much left of it today. There's probably just some stone foundations, but I'm gonna go off into those thick spruce trees over there and see if I can find anything. And I see something up there. Looks like an old stone chimney just poking out of the, the undergrowth of the forest. And uh, the fort itself would have been built out of spruce logs cut right here. And uh, let's just kind of hack through here. It's a little bit eerie. Kind of just seeing ruins in the middle of nowhere. Reminds you of uh, the ghosts of the past, as it were. That, you know, hundreds of years ago, there were explorers here before me. Oh, wow, that's really neat. Look at that. You can see the masonry work in there. So this is a chimney. We've got some rocks down below. Wow, that's actually quite neat. A bit of wood sticking out of it, too. Everything else must have rotted away and been swallowed up by the forest over the last 200 years. These are granite rocks pulled out of the lake shore there. Oh, yeah, I can see straight up the chimney. I mean, it's a little bit eerie, the ghosts of the past, but it's also very fascinating um, from a historical perspective to think that hundreds of years ago, this forest here would have been cleared out and they would have had a fort with cannons and muskets and high wooden walls. The river I'm trying to find is named after the guy who was in charge of this fort, Deese. Um, so I'm looking for the Deese River. Well, let's get back down to the canoe. I don't like to leave my canoe uh, for too long. I get we get kind of separation anxiety when we're apart. So I tied it up down there on the water and I better get back to it. He was really curious, but then I accidentally made a noise with my paddle. He ran off, he got scared. Off, just trying to get dry in the sun, and the bugs are just swarming it. Somewhere out here in the forest should be the remains of Douglas's cabin from over a century ago. And I think I see it up here. Yeah, I can see it now. So just the uh, parts of the walls are left, but the roof has collapsed. In over a hundred years, the elements have done that to it. But there's the inside of the cabin. And you can see over there in the corner, this was his, uh, this would have been his fireplace over here. I mean, the preservation's pretty good in this cold environment, right? It's a pretty dry environment, despite the snow. So things don't rot that well, but in a hundred years, the roof has collapsed. But there it is down in there. So that would have been his hearth very important for the long, cold Canadian winter. And that's all that remains of it. You can see the construction along the side. And just very slowly, the forest is gonna swallow it up and it'll vanish into the wilderness. And there won't be anything left of it. But now I gotta get back to the canoe and continue my own journey upriver. Last night when I was setting up my tent, I discovered uh, there was a hole in it, a little small hole in the screen here. And I was inside my tent at the time and I had nothing to patch it with other than a bandage. But now I've got my duct tape, so I'm gonna make a little more uh, proper repair to the, the mesh there so the bugs 
cannot find a way in and bite me in the middle of the night. There's just an unbelievable number of those horse flies on this beach and all over the river. You can see someone, there's just a bunch of them accumulating inside my tent, or under the tent fly, there's one right there. And uh, they're big suckers. And when they bite you, it feels almost more like a bee sting. And if you uh, want to see what it looks like, it's like a welt where one got me um, right there on the shin today. Another one bit me down there. Millions of mosquitoes and black flies, just swarms of them all over the place down there on my gear. And just, they're so bad that I'm just not even gonna brush my teeth this morning because I can't take this bug net off to brush my teeth with like millions of mosquitoes buzzing all over the place. So I'm just gonna go. skies are dark and I can see that a storm is coming so I just kind of want to batter down the hatches and secure all the gear. I had a quick fire, made some herbal tea and some uh, dinner really fast and I just threw my backpack under there and my paddle and I'm going to jump in the tent. You don't want to be caught out in the open. The storm. This tent's been pretty strong so far but this is the first real um, big test of it. Good. Intensifying, definitely intensifying. You know, there's something about a storm alone in the wilderness. Uh, you can get on your nerves a little, but I've been through a heck of a lot of storms in the wilderness, like probably over 50 of them. And uh, you just have to wait it out and try to, Jeez, my tent is really flying around all over the place. Water coming off down there. map to follow and I think uh, this is the creek here that I'm on and I'm gonna go across the tundra here and through the, the marshes and then I'll see the lonely mountain and I'm gonna head for that lonely mountain and I have to cross some fields of ice but eventually it'll take me over into the dismal lakes I'm gonna hope to try to do this in just three loads so if it's a 10 kilometer portage one way I would take my big heavy pack first that's 20 kilometers, 10 kilometers there, 10 kilometers back. Then I would go to this barrel, which I've loaded fully right up to the brim. It's got to weigh close to 50 pounds. That would be another 10 kilometers there, 10 kilometers back. So that would be 20, 40 kilometers. I'm going to try to follow the sand ridge uh, to begin with. I saw some wolf tracks over here. So it looks like the wolves use it as a highway. And I'm going to do that as well. Here's, here's some faint wolf tracks. There's one down there. And uh, they went that way, so I'm gonna go that way as well. About 10 kilometers from me, and uh, that's it, the Lonely Mountain, and that's where I wanna get to. And you can see the trail, the drag marks where I dragged the canoe all the way over there and across and through those trees several kilometers away and uh, it's sand and gravel so it's a little bit hard on the canoe but i don't really have a choice at this point i feel really privileged to be here right now amidst such beauty maybe not so privileged when there's hordes of black flies and mosquitoes eating me alive but um, this view is just magnificent and i'm really soaking it in right now and looking forward to another freeze-dried meal this canoe has been through the ice, it's been over the rocks, up river, down river, pulling, paddling, it's, it's 
taken a lot of abuse, but you know, thus far there's no leaks and it's still still uh, standing up to the rigors of this journey. So I just hope that uh, so far so good and that it stays that way. And there they are at long last, my first glimpse of the dismal lakes. And they don't look that dismal to me from up here. They look actually quite refreshing after this uh, nightmarish portage with horrible bugs and marshes and high hills. So the dismal lakes look pretty good from the up here. That's what I thought of that book. No sense in carrying any extra weight than I need to. Packing another book doesn't make any sense. So there you go. But for sentimental reasons, I did actually, uh, I saved the cover. I saved the cover, I'm gonna keep that. My neck was massacred by black flies the other day on that portage. I'll show you some of the bites if you can see them down in there. And the black flies just love to go for the neck. And uh, yeah, they've just bit me all over the place in there, portaging. It's a pretty cold night and I, I don't mind that. It, I actually kind of like getting cozy inside my sleeping bag here and uh, huddling down with all my extra sweaters and blankets and things. You can see the tent buckling under the pressure. And you can hear the wind howling. rock wall on this side to cut down on the wind rushing underneath the tent fly. If nothing else, it was creating a lot of noise and keeping me up at night. It's not really anything else I can do. Everything is pretty exposed out here by the dismal lakes. So that's where I'm headed, out there. the expedition goes on the more my gear starts to suffer the effects of wear and tear and had a couple of holes in it up here and the uh, fabric was coming out it looked like they were burned singed by the fire but I don't know how because that's in my hood there's the other hole in my tent down there that I patched with actual duct tape wristband broke off of it so now I'm just using it as an old-fashioned pocket watch that I keep in my pocket this busted off of it so I'm gonna try to repair that otherwise I don't have a bear banger which wouldn't be good. You know, after a month and a half or more, two months almost being out here, my tent begins to feel like home. Like this is my home and I'm really, um, when I'm warm and dry in here and it's cold and wet outside, it just feels like the greatest luxury in the world. It feels like a five-star hotel to me. My path up the copper mine is blocked by a massive canyon. It represents a huge obstacle. I'm gonna have to do a really long portage up over these tall cliffs uh, to get around it. So I've got all my gear here. I've just prepped it. And uh, I tied my hiking boots onto the outside because for the first one, I've got to wear these wading shoes, which are bigger, heavy. So I'm just gonna wear them, leave them over there and then switch into the hiking boots. I've got three loads to do, the barrel, the backpack, 
this barrel I've emptied, so it's now empty, and then finally the canoe. And it's gonna be hard because this is one heck of a canyon. I come across a rather unexpected site, which is this monument. In the last place on earth, you'd probably expect to see a monument. Uh, it says, David and Carol Jones, who loved the North and its people, were drowned in these rapids on August 14th, 1972. They respected honesty and truth. You know, seeing that, it's a very solemn reminder of the hazards involved in a wilderness journey like this. And it's uh, very touching. I feel for them and their family. And uh, I want to take a moment to pay my respects to fellow wilderness travelers. It makes me want to be extra cautious because it's a reminder of you know what can go wrong. Um, the slightest mistake out here. But that's what I'm portaging around this big canyon. It was a pretty demoralizing day, I have to say. It was just really brutally hard labor all day long. The bugs were awful. And I knew coming into the expedition that this phase would be one of the most physically rigorous of the whole journey. Uh, the Coppermine River, which is just a big, powerful river with strong white water, water rapids, and waterfalls and canyons on it. And uh, that's why no one travels up river on it, but that's exactly what I'm trying to do here. And, you know, I put in a very long 11 hours of uh, travel, but I only made it about 12 or 13 kilometers up river. So that kind of took the wind out of my sails. And uh, I mean, you can see the river right there. Didn't have the great best camping place either, but you can see how strong the current is in the river. And, and that's not even like a strong part. That's just like the ordinary part. Hearn depicts this area, and this is, you know, 247 years ago, as very windswept, barren, rocky tundra with not a lot of tree cover, maybe just scattered spruce here and there. I mean, there is some trees, but not many. And that's also the impression I got from the 1820 accounts written by John Franklin and uh, John Richardson, two later British explorers. And yet here we have, you know, a pretty large, extensive spruce forest. And that makes you wonder about things. Um, is this the result of global warming? Could be. Uh, we know that the climate has been warming since about the mid 19th century. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think that's about right, right? The Little Ice Age came to an end and then the climate has been warming. So it's possible that over the past almost a quarter of a millennium, it's a long time since Samuel Hearn was here in human terms, um, the forest has really grown up and there's trees where there was never trees before because uh, the climate is warming. So it's been uh, 55 days since I left the Arctic Circle. Longer since I started camping though. It's cold, but refreshing. Mm. Oh! Every night I have a little ritual that I do inside my tent. It's called kill all the black flies that come inside the tent with me. And if you can hear that gentle pitter patter, it's not the sound of rain against my tent fly. It's the sign, sound of hundreds of black flies against it as they get trapped under the fly and they try to escape. But some of them get inside here with me. No matter how quick, no matter how nimble I am, when I dive through the tent door, some of them come inside. My toe is still pretty swollen and busted up. The fact is, it just, your feet take a beating when you're on them 13, 14 hours a day, wading through rapids and rivers and boulders and whatnot. So they're my favorite bird. Although what I don't like about them is when I'm paddling by the shore and they have a nest nearby, it turns into the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds, and they swarm at me. 
And if you look carefully, you'll see that they have very sharp beaks. It's July 22nd. I'm waiting for the sound of the bush plane. So I'm looking forward to some new food rations and uh, fresh batteries. And I'm just waiting here, so. It's him. He's gonna touch down. Nice. Food is on the way. It's uh, raining for the fourth straight day, and it's about 11 o'clock at night. I'm inside my tent, and uh, I'm still nice and dry and warm and snug in here. And it's gonna take more than rain and bugs to deter me. what I'm dealing with here, the white water of the Copper Mine River. There was no way to drag up through that or pull, so I had to portage around it. my waiter and it's just those two little punctures there that are costing me all my grief. So then I take some of this from the tree, my Swiss army knife, and then when that has melted I'll lather it onto the uh, waiter. And you can see I've applied some of the spruce resin to the hole in the waiter with the, the stick here and hopefully this does the job. It's uh, July 31st and the bugs are just atrocious this morning. They were bad last night, but I mean, there's just massive clouds of them here. The uh, fantastic news is that my uh, patch on my waders using the re resin from the spruce tree has held up like a dream. So in the end, it was nature's solution that did the job that um, modern materials couldn't. Duct tape, Gorilla tape didn't work on its own, but when I heated that resin up and put it on, uh, it worked like a charm, and now I've got dry feet. Oh my goodness, there's a jackpot over here. In Newfoundland, they call these bake apples. Mmm. 
It's so good. I still uh, can't entirely dispel a bit of anxiety that I feel. It's still an open question whether or not I'll even make it to Baker Lake. It's just such a long way and winter is coming. I mean, winter could come in August, I don't know. Um, it's impossible to say, so I'm just super conscious at all times that time is running out. Not too far away to the southwest is the tree line, and that marks the start of vast forests that cloak northern Canada. And somewhere down there to the southwest, there must be some pretty bad forest fires raging right now. Still a little hazy from those forest fires. I only really have, at this point, five weeks of decent weather left, and it's gonna probably take more than that for me to get to Baker Lake. Right now, the task of the moment is to kill all these friggin' black flies inside the tent with me, because there's a lot of them. I repeat, that is not a rock. Those cries are coming from some waterfowl out there on the lake. They make the strangest cries, like a child in distress, just as I'm about to uh, call it a night. Listen to the birds crying. And look at that. Isn't it like the land before time? Dinosaurs roam the earth over there. I have to get my canoe across all of that and all of my gear for about a kilometer. Well, I just completed the fourth portage of the day. I got the canoe across all in one shot, carried it over my head, because I didn't want to risk uh, any more abuse to it than necessary, dragging it over these rocks. Well, in a land of desolate rock, as far as the eye can see, um, old as time, this is the oldest rock on the planet, goes back billions of years. Uh, it's rather ironic and good for me that I have this beautiful little bed here for the night. I'm gonna call this home for tonight and sleep in this nice little patch of lichens and Labrador tea and crowberries. For the first time in like almost three months, I can see the moon, and it's a full moon, and there's always something to me anyways special about a full moon, but it's starting to get dark. And the night is dark and full of terror, as they say. paddle for over 11 hours and almost all of it against the wind and you really just want to make dinner and crawl inside your tent but you can't because there's uh, water down your stove. First animal that pops into mind almost immediately is polar bear. I don't know what it's all from it's just the wear and tear and the abuse that your body goes through on an expedition like this. Thunder clouds rolling in across the tundra. And that's always a little ominous.
Look at this nice beach all to myself. How lovely. This is where a grizzly bear has dug up the burrows of some arctic ground squirrels because the grizzlies love to eat the ground squirrels. So that's what this is here. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. I'm gonna go now and uh, paddle as hard as I can for as long as I can, for as long as the lake stays calm. But it's another rainy morning and I have to get up and hike all the way back to the start of the canyon, grab my canoe, which I left there, portage it across the canyon, or at least up to this point, which is kind of like the halfway point, and continue the portage in four loads, um, taking all of my stuff all the way across the canyon. I have to do it. Well, good thing I got waders on because that's pretty deep. Hasn't been bright for a while. It's just this the dismal gray skies um, hanging over the land. So it's made it hard to really dry stuff out. I got some wet clothes that I can't dry for lack of sun. And I'm running kind of low on my battery life too because I haven't been able to re recharge anything. Um, with my solar panel because there hasn't been enough sun. But I'm gonna get cozy as I can inside the tent because the nights are getting cold now that it's later in the season. And um, the nights are also getting darker. Um, it's getting dark early and it's staying dark longer now that we're getting late in the season. And I'm not really sure at this point how much longer it's going to take me to get to Baker Lake, but that's what I'm pushing myself 12 hours a day to get to. It's Baker Lake, the little Inuit community. Right now, my biggest uh, concern is the wind. The wind has been fierce all day, just really powerful wind gusts that make canoeing downriver seem like I'm still going upriver. At times, the current has been, or the wind has been so strong that it actually has pushed me back upriver despite the strong current. Basically, I've tried to shift everything out of the, the back end of the canoe, the stern, up to the front. So I've loaded up the front as much as I can, the bow of the canoe, um, with anything I've got, you know, GoPros, water bottles, my backpack, and I've shifted the barrels up to the front as well to concentrate the weight up at the bow of the canoe that's going downriver into that headwind, that really strong wind. Doing it this way is allowing me to make progress even against that strong wind. Um, otherwise, with the canoe lightly loaded in the bow, the wind is just spinning my canoe, and I would literally just spin 360 degrees and not get anywhere. So shifting the weight up to the front is making the canoe go downriver even into the wind. I 
pulled ashore here because I could see that there was some serious trouble waiting for me up ahead. We've got a rapid there. That's not the real problem. It's what's beyond the rapid. That's a vertical drop and I can see the mist rising. There's a big waterfall there and another canyon. It goes into that canyon there. I know that I'm not obviously not the first person to canoe this river because I'm following some historic reports, but uh, obviously someone at some point came before me and wasn't fully prepared for just how grueling and long the portages around these huge canyons actually are. Because look at this, someone has abandoned all this stuff right here. There's a barrel, a bag of garbage, three backpacks, some other bags, some empty Coleman camp fuel. And uh, these bags have been here for quite a while. You can see the water's accumulated on top and they're drenched and they're pretty old, ripped up, and sand's accumulated around them. You know, I believe fundamentally that coming to this wilderness is a privilege. And uh, no matter how difficult and backbreaking it may be, uh, you have a responsibility to pack in anything you, or pack out anything you bring in with you, right? You can't just throw stuff away. Um, the litter out here is, is a real travesty. It's a very famous grove on the Thelon River, and it's in that spruce forest that in 1927, John Hornby and his two companions starved to death in their cabin. They were depending on the caribou migration. They never found it. The geese have started to fly south. Winter is coming. to four months since I actually last saw my fiance and since I was last home. And I don't know how long it'll take me to complete the end of this journey and get to Baker Lake um, because the weather is beyond my control and wind is such a critical factor. Today with the wind in my favor, I traveled probably a hundred kilometers, but if it goes against me, I'm lucky if I can get 10 done in a day. The moose, uh is really enjoying the beach. Came up here on his summer vacation from the forest down south. Heard that they had some nice beaches up here on the river. just just fell in the water looks like bad news if I'm very lucky the wind might blow them right past me but my canoe is still down there and I got to go get it and bring it up here um, I've made camp here And 
This canoe has just been an absolute warrior. I'm amazed at how tough it is. <laughs> you can see it's suffered quite a lot of damage um, from the ice and the rocks and everything else, but there's no leaks in it whatsoever, and it's holding its own, so very sturdy canoe, and I'm very lucky uh, and fortunate to have it with me. one in a meditative and reflective mood, I suppose, when you're out here alone in the wilderness and you're just wandering across the land and you come across a human skull just lying there in the open. Out of respect, uh, I'm not gonna film it and show the bones on camera, so I didn't film it. And I guess if I were superstitious and afraid of ghosts, I might be a little apprehensive, but fortunately I'm not and I find it more um, interesting than anything. So it's early morning and I've just got my canoe loaded behind me. The wind's still pretty strong, but I'm gonna paddle hard. And I'm in the final phase of the journey at this point. Uh, the end is almost in sight, so I gotta get going here. Since day one of the expedition, stashed away in my barrel, I've been saving this uh, tea, tea bag, cinnamon apple. And uh, I had it before I left on the expedition when I was back home, and I thought it was really delicious. And I had a second one of these, so I decided to um, take it with me on the expedition, and I only had this one. All my other herbal tea was mulled apple, but this cinnamon apple one is like of a much uh, better quality. And I've saved it this whole expedition. Let's get that off of there. So down behind me there, that's my uh, last campsite of the expedition, fingers crossed. If everything goes according to plan, the weather holds out, I should be uh, good to paddle the rest of the way to Baker Lake, the little community, and uh, that'll end my journey alone across the Arctic. So, yeah, it's uh, been over 100 days now, solo, it's September 5th, and first thing tomorrow, September 6th, I'm gonna paddle into town. It's not quite over yet, anything could still happen. The dawn could bring some crazy weather, a bear could come and maul me in the night, a mox oxen could plow inside my tent, could get struck by lightning, so, you know, I don't wanna celebrate just yet, but, um, tomorrow when I reach Baker Lake, then uh, the journey will be over. It's the morning of September 6th, and I'm just packing up my uh, canoe for the final time. I'm about to set off on the final leg of my journey to reach Baker Lake. So this is day 102 since I left the Arctic Circle and nearly four months since I left home. You only live once, you're only young ones. And I've always been very conscious of that fact when it comes to planning my expeditions. And I really wanna push myself hard now because I feel like I'm in my prime and I have to do these expeditions and I wanna continue doing them for as long as I'm able to. One day, if I'm able to look back when I'm old on all the adventures and journeys that I've done, hopefully I'll have some satisfaction that I saw the wilderness while it still exists. There's a tinge of regret and sadness that it's coming to an end because I really love the expedition and I really love the journey. And there's a part of me that wishes I could keep going.
Yeah, that's as good as I was expecting. Well, Adam Schultz is a writer, explorer, and public speaker who has hiked to all corners of this country. His new book is entitled A History of Canada in Ten Maps. It tells the story of Canada from the Vikings to the early 19th century. And Adam joins me now. And I guess first off, Adam, uh, welcome back. You just recently returned. Uh, yeah, I was in the Arctic for the last four months doing a journey across as my own Canada 150 project. But uh, it's great to be back and here in the studio. Han har galeri 